Hi everyone and welcome to another very special video on the Jams and Tea channel where this time I'm going to be walking you through one of the best discographies of all time in my estimation. All 16 albums from the legendary indie rockers Yola Tengo. Yola Tengo were formed in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1984, went through a rotating roundup of bassists in their first decade before finally settling on the trio that any Yola Tengo fan knows. Husband and wife duo Ira Kaplan and Georgia Hubley and longtime bassist James McNew. Yola Tengo are one of the fixtures of modern American indie rock, one of the most influential bands to ever come out of the 90s alternative rock wave, and a band that owe as much to the classical foundations laid by 60s rock and roll acts as they have influenced bands that have come forward in indie rock in the 2000s and 2010s. By my estimation and in my humble and of course very biased opinion, Yola Tengo are the greatest American band to ever do it. Maybe not the first or one of the most foundational but one of the most inventive and versatile and special bands I think that there have ever been and they have in their stead a discography of numerous great records, a number of masterpieces as we'll discuss and a track record that is to be seriously envied. But we have a lot of albums to get through so let's not waste any time. First up on the list of Every single Yola Tengo studio album ranked from worst to best at number 16, New Wave Hot Dogs. 1987's New Wave Hot Dogs was the band's second album, and it is altogether noisier, more unkempt, and less focused than their debut, though certainly it showcases a band that are beginning to find their own distinct identity more clearly than before. It opens with a jangly clunk which bears more than a passing resemblance to Blue Oyster Cult's Don't Fear the Reaper. Did I Tell You is the clear standout of the record, with the best melody and the most fully realized structure of any of the album's original songs, even though it would be superseded in a re-recorded form that we'll get to. Lewis is a gem also, a gentle jangle pop tune with a delightfully gnarly guitar solo and some wonderfully jazzy fills from Georgia on the drums. Perhaps the most noteworthy inclusion on the record is a cover of the Velvet Underground B-side, It's Alright The Way That You Live, which is the most stately song here, though unfortunately not particularly flavorful or soulful in a way that their best covers would go on to be. And put a pin in that note of covers, because Yola Tengo are a band that excel in covers, and we'll be talking about a number of them in the rankings to come. The Velvet Underground are one of the clearest influences that you can see on Yola Tengo, so it's fitting that in their early days they would cover them. A band that revolutionized rock and roll and paved the way for innovative fusions of beauty, conventionally speaking, and noise, conventionally speaking. Which is a template that Yola Tengo would build on in incredible ways, as we'll soon discuss. Overall, New Wave Hot Dogs is not a bad album, but it does come perilously close to being entirely unremarkable, and it's comfortably their least essential studio release. Number 15, Ride the Tiger. The band's debut record, Ride the Tiger, shows signs of promise and lives in the shadow of more angular power pop bands like The Feelies, whom Ira Kaplan cites as one of the biggest inspirations for starting a band in the first place. Notably, Ride the Tiger is one of the band's prettiest records, due in no small part, I'm sure, to the presence of original second guitarist Dave Schramm, who would depart the band shortly thereafter. The closest thing to a noise rager here is the stormy, the evil that men do, which makes a whole lot of noise but little impression. Some Something the band may have agreed with, seeing as they would revisit multiple times in the future to alter the arrangement or just to riff on it. Highlights include a faithful and well suited cover of the Kinks classic Big Sky, the moody but melodic The Forest Green, and the overlong but gorgeous The Pain of Pain which is the closest sign here to the particular brand of gentle and emotive atmospheric indie rock that this band would go on to perfect. The best track here though is the stellar opener, The Cone of Silence, which instantly announces the band with a memorable melody, spacious production style, and slackerish vocals from Ira that no doubt were inspired by Sonic Youth. 
However, unfortunately, the back half of this album is severely lacking in memorable or well-realized moments, with the exception of All Rock's Bells, which stands out as one of the record's most sonically unusual and adventurous tracks. Worth a shot for the moody but gorgeous R.E.M.-esque guitar tones and luscious experimentations with reverb on a record that can otherwise seem frustratingly dry. Number 14. We Have Amnesia Sometimes Jumping ahead to the band's most recent release, We Have Amnesia Sometimes barely qualifies as an album and is only really a studio release in a technical sense as it is a series of unmastered drone recordings captured during the initial lockdown of the COVID-19 pandemic while the band gathered to jam in their recording space. Essentially what they did is they put a single microphone in the middle of their recording space and experimented with various textures using their instruments, creating these strange and beguiling drones. However, this is more than just a cobbled together collection of faceless tracks. The trio have sequenced them carefully into a structure that feels as though it builds, subtly but pointedly, in intensity and effect with each passing track. These are static drones that linger from anywhere between 5 to 9 minutes, but they serve as an intriguing continuation of the band's experimentation with ambient music in recent years, and are decidedly evocative, if slight, at times. Fans of the band's typically sharp songwriting may find nothing to engage with here, but fans of the band's sonic experimentation and enjoyers of drone music in general may enjoy the fuzzed out bliss and haze of this short sub 40 minute record. Number 13, President Yola Tingo. Building on the more rambunctious but poorly realized scrawl of new wave hot dogs, the band's third album, President Yola Tingo, sees them diving deeper into experimentations with avant-garde song structures, formless guitar noise, and unconventional writing. All of these are at their best with opener Barnaby hardly working which I can say with a degree of comfort is the band's first truly great song. A brilliantly propulsive performance from Georgia serving as the bed for a looping distorted drone, rich keyboard tones, and a classically laid back Ira Croon. It's a marvelous song, and the rest of the record unfortunately never matches it. Drug Test is a decently jangly number with some slightly snotty vocals and a pointed beat that gives it some weight, and the closing cover of the Bob Dylan Nashville Skyline era track, I Threw It All Away, is a welcome addition to the band's slowly growing canon of strong covers. The second best thing here though, and another early period favourite of mine, is the soft, dreamy, countryfied mid-tempo Alida. Ida's is not in the most ideal vocal mode to truly elevate this one, but George's wordless backing vocals and the gently poignant melody make it a deep cut worth treasuring. Number 12. There's a riot going on. The last proper, refined studio album from Yola Tingo to date, 2018's There's a Riot Going On is an undervalued gem in the band's continually expanding catalogue that may not approach the highs of their best work for the most part, but nonetheless has its own gently sweet joys and unique pleasures that make it a valuable addition to the discography. Expectation and the level of quality established by this band I think can both harm the experience of the ironically titled Riot comfortably the band's quietest record to date. It is essentially an ambient album, on top of which songs will occasionally happen. Depending on your mood and sensibility, this may either be a maddeningly dull proposition, or just what you need. For me, I lean far towards the latter more often than not, as this is consistently soothing without relenting from that mode in a way the band have seldom had the courage to fully commit to before. Opener You Are Here is one of their finest instrumental tracks, featuring a soothing, effects-laden guitar stretching across the soundscape as Georgia and James serve a fitting but unobtrusive rhythmic backdrop. Dreamy highs like she may, she might. What chance have I got? 
and Ashes showcase how this new aesthetic can complement the band in songwriting mode, particularly the latter two, where Georgia taking the lead is a smart decision as her voice is even better fitted to this hypnagogic state than Iris. The record is curiously structured to feature three wordless ambient tracks in the dead center, the trio of Dream Dream Away, Shortwave, and Above the Sound, which each experiment with droning soundscapes in distinctive and affecting ways. However, this being a Yola Tingo album, there is still one unequivocal masterpiece here, in the form of fourth track, For You Too which stands headstrong above the rest as one of the band's greatest songs to date. If the album itself sounds like a non-starter for you, make sure you don't miss this utterly heartwarming lead single, one of many perfect love songs in the band's catalogue. Number 11, Fake Book. Joined again by founding member Dave Schramm, 1990's Fake Book might be an easy record to overlook given its MO as a covers album. However, this being Yola Tingo, it's not as simple as that proposition might seem, given that the band are including fresh covers here alongside new originals and even re-recordings of old songs reimagined, and in both instances, Bettered. It's a curious collection that's by nature a little jagged and inconsistent, but hits far, far more often than it misses, and hangs together surprisingly well. The new originals, including opener Can't Forget, show a band refining their tender side with a clearly developing mastery, and the re-recordings of early songs Barnaby Hardly Working and Did I Tell You take the band's two best songs before this album and make them even better. For as much as I sang the praises of the version of Barnaby on their previous album, this one feels like the definitive take, harnessing the gently surreal tenderness of the tune and making it a certified Yola Tingo classic. As for the covers themselves, as mentioned, the quality varies. Sometimes the band swings for the fences with jaunty folksy tunes like the holy modal rounders Griselda and Rex Garvin's Emulsified, the former of which is a kitschy joy, and the latter of which is probably the worst thing the band have ever put on an album. Still, covers of the tremolos Cat Stevens penned Here Comes My Baby, Daniel Johnston's Beguiling Speeding Motorcycle, The Kinks' late era deep cut stunner Oklahoma USA, and John Cale's Paris 1919 standout Andalusia showcase a band with confidence, class and command at all times and are essential listening. Fake Book's patchwork flavour quickly becomes its biggest strength, a delightfully irreverent record that refuses to take itself seriously at every turn and is all the better for it. Number 10. May I Sing With Me And like that, Yola Tingo arrived. More or less. 1992's May I Sing With Me marked the end of a period of eight years during which the band cycled through over a dozen bassists, as here marks the beginning of a fruitful partnership between Ira, Georgia, and the now inimitable and indispensable James McNew, who feels as much a part of the fabric of this band as its founding couple. While the record that followed this one is generally regarded as the beginning of their golden streak, in my humble opinion, May I Sing With Me deserves credit for getting them there, as about half of this record is every bit as good as what was to come, and the rest of it, while comparatively lacking, is hardly disposable. Opener Devouring America With Horns showcases a band that sound fully realised, confident, deploying each instrument into the fray one by one, building up to a swelling maelstrom that makes them feel, for the first time, utterly untouchable. Fast paced gem upside down follows, and it's one of the band's most instantaneous, satisfying pop rock tunes. The pace is upended immediately by the daring, very Sonic Youth-esque noise jam of Mushroom Cloud of Hiss, which barrels forward before collapsing and then eventually regrouping itself across nine thrilling minutes. The album's best track is its centerpiece 
the six minute five cornered drone, crispy duck, which is just a sheer guitar masterclass, mingling pretty jangling tones with bent, distorted, feedback laden noise scrawl, including some of the most truly remarkable soloing from Ira that feels as if it could go on endlessly, as it damn near would in future iterations of this mode. The climax of this track is as satisfying an arrival as any on a Yola Tengo song up to this point, and while the rest of the album is less immediately remarkable from here, as a whole, May I Sing With Me proves to be an important step in the development of the band, and one that I could completely understand ranking much higher than this. Number 9. Stuff Like That There 15 years after Fake Book, the band released this carefully composed sequel album, which revisits the concept of compiling covers with re-recordings of old songs and originals. And this is arguably an even better, more full and well-realized execution of the concept. Frankly, I was close to ranking this even higher, because I find myself during each listen marveling at how well the collection comes together as an album, with its own identity, and a showcase of the band's seasoned strengths in a gentler, more autumnal mode, without veering into either deranged guitar noise, nor pure ambience like records either side of it would do. This is a lovely album. And if you're looking for music that will do anything other than wrap a warm blanket around you, look elsewhere. Stuff like that there received less attention and critical adulation for its irreverent title and unfashionable sound, but it truly feels like a lost gem, where the songs are brought to life by some of the band's crispest production, and the audible aging of their voices since the fake book days. Which may make this a record with greater appeal to the sensibilities of older listeners, but really anyone with a little patience and taste for classical folk and rock songwriting will find plenty to enjoy here. Originals Rickety and A While Away are both as good as anything you'll hear from the band in their late period. Re-recordings of Deeper Into Movies, All Your Secrets, and The Ballad of Red Buckets transform the tone drastically in the case of movies, into new forms which accentuate pre-existing strengths of the compositions that may have been more difficult to initially appreciate. The covers veer from a stellar Georgia-led take on The Cure's Friday I'm In Love, to a somber but similarly potent approach to Hank Williams' I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry, to a stellar reimagining of Parliament's I Can Feel the Ice Melting, and much more. This is a true gem that in many ways satisfies more at this late stage than even a record of full originals might, and reminds you of all the reasons this is one of the most special and important, reverent but inventive American bands to ever do it. Number 8. Popular Songs This is the point in the list, fittingly at about the halfway mark, where we transition from the great records to the excellent ones. This is the point at which every remaining record on this list should be considered essential listening for anyone wishing to get a strong measure of this great band. And though the wryly titled popular songs might suggest something similar to the previously mentioned covers albums, this is all originals, and a great showcase of the band's strength in many different modes of their sound. Though its occasionally murky production and bizarre structure may slightly hold it back from masterpiece territory, the songs themselves here hold up under scrutiny. From the fuzzing string-laden opener Here to Fall, to the 70s dream pop-esque Avalon, to the and then nothing style mood piece of by twos, to the rollicking synthesizer laden shoegaze banger nothing to hide, to the sparse but hilarious elevator funk of the Booker T-esque periodically double or triple. And that's just the first five songs. Deep cuts like the organ laden sleep aid I'm on my way and the tenderly starlit when it's dark provide lovely star turns for James and Georgia respectively. And ninth track, All Your Secrets, is an instant classic, with some of the warmest organ tones on any Yola Tingo song. 
at points so emotionally evocative that it can bring me to tears. One of their finest moments. And that bizarre structure I mentioned earlier? Boy does that kick in from here. The last three tracks on popular songs are a succession of serene, hypnotic instrumental jams, with increasing length and decreasing lyrics, together taking up a full half of the record's 70 minute runtime. The best of the three is More Stars Than There Are In Heaven which across its 9 minutes builds a bed of warm electric guitars, bass and soothing vocals that amount to one of the most plainly beautiful songs this band have ever released. The dreamy acoustic ambience of the fireside and the 16 minute guitar solo jam and the glitter is gone round out a record that matches in length the amount of time it remains one of their most refreshing, nocturnal set of songs, perfect for stargazing and laying in the dark and holding someone tight. Number 7. Fade. Following a string of lengthy, jam-heavy records, 2013's Fade felt like a much needed refocusing of the band's core strengths and a peering back of excesses into a short, sweet collection of richly produced, skyward reaching and themic tracks that are fun and satisfying to holler along to. Particularly opener Ohm, which feels like a rare moment deep in this discography where a band are suddenly capable of something you would have never predicted they'd do, somehow without veering at all from the template they've established. The rest of the record is understated, pretty and comfortable in ways that may leave some listeners longing for the noise, but that feels so refined and warm, with the exception of the slightly too slight and poorly positioned Well You Better, that they comprise a consistent, dare I say it, vibe that 99% of bands would struggle to match without sounding derivative or numbing. Mid-album acoustic number I'll Be Around is curiously the band's most streamed song on Spotify, owing no doubt in part to a feature on the soundtrack of Richard Linklater's Boyhood, but also probably because it is one of the gentlest and most pure little songs that Ira has ever written, something that will undeniably outlive him and remain a classic to be covered ad infinitum long into the future. A favourite of mine is George's deep cut, Cornelia and Jane, which is an oblique but moving character study rendered in second person, with a soft but insistent pulse and the most gorgeously soft horn section you'll ever hear on a Yola Tingo song. Overall, Fade is a record that makes up for its lack of immediacy by being a collection of some of the most enduring, well-composed songs this band have ever released, a late career highlight that with its modest 45 minute runtime, will satisfy fans of the band's softer side looking for a quick and concise fix. Number 6. Painful. It's With a gently lulling organ tone, a loping two note bass line, and a twinkly minimal brush of guitar, Ira Kaplan utters these words and without fail, I am swept into the assured soundscape of a band who have fully and completely found their niche and explore it so thoroughly that they are able to craft their first classic. For me, Painful is the place to begin with exploring Yola Tingo and it's difficult to fault that recommendation. Though shorter and more contained than the multifaceted masterpieces to come, Painful has no shortage of the band's atmospherically blissful jams and raucously noisy numbers, demonstrated pointedly with the two versions of Big Day coming. However, the true genius of this record, and the thing they have finally mastered for the first time here, is synthesizing these two sounds within the same song, something they do frequently and to great effect. Complementing the noise with the haze while still separating the two at intervals to moderate the pace, Painful becomes an artfully constructed and wholly satisfying listening experience that rewards the many hours fans will inevitably spend spinning it over and over again. 
powerful fusions include the rip-roaring riff intro from a Motel 6, giving way to plaintive, loping guitar lines and fuzzed out bass. The mesmerizing sudden organ delivers exactly what the title promises, fleshing out the steady presence of the keys with shuffling drums and minimal soloing that feels equal parts colorfully playful and eerily surreal. Standout Double Dare bears an instant classic riff that's deployed only occasionally, showcasing restraint and poise for imposing tension and release, an aspect of the band's composition that strengthens the satisfaction of the songs holistically and the power they wield on re-listen. The two gentlest songs here, the aforementioned opener, Big Day Coming, and the utterly show-stopping Nowhere Near, feel torn out of 1950s suburban America, a landscape of encroaching post-war industrial revival where smoky chimneys are evoked as clearly as still riversides, and the neon haze of street lamps hanging over kissing young couples. Closer, I Heard You Looking is, spoiler alert I suppose, my absolute favourite Yola Tingo song. It's not necessarily the best or the most demonstrative of all the aspects that make them great, but there's simply not another song in the world that wrings the emotion and catharsis out of me that this one does. It's a single 7 minute guitar solo from Ira, backed with warm but unobtrusive bass tones from James and steady timekeeping from Georgia, but Ira's guitar is front and centre the entire time and through its breathless reiteration of one of the greatest riffs ever composed, alongside its endless diversions into squalling noise explorations of the permutations of those notes, it resolutely refuses to stand still or back down, and as a result has the most triumphant feel of perhaps any song I can think of, something that makes you feel as large and unstoppable as the amps that power its sounds into the abyss, the sort of wordless sonic miasma that evades easy description. It's ridiculously simple, yet nothing else can approach its effect and potency. Even the shorter moments here like Superstar Watcher feel somehow cut from the same well of spiritual energy even if they're over practically as soon as they begin. With an album like Painful, you're left lingering in the margins more often than the centre of the page, and there's not a moment wasted. Number 5. Summer Sun It's hard to say whether it's the bizarrely anonymous cover, the dryly bland and poorly matched title, or just the fact that Yola Tingo had been so relentlessly praised for so long, as to why Summer Sun is considered one of this band's weakest albums. Perhaps it's because of interesting but slight missteps like the dissonant piano crooner Nothing But You And Me and the languorous Don't Have To Be So Sad, both of which utilise a looped reversed drum machine sample that can become grating at extended runtimes. However, guess what? Neither of those songs are bad, and they represent the full extent of criticism I can aim at this album. Seriously, this is undeniably a record that treads more in the moody gloom of its predecessor, 2000's And Then Nothing Turned Itself Inside Out, than any of the records that came before that, but it finds new ways to render the nocturnal prettiness of that record in a slightly more colourful, at points even irreverent, and always inventive new form. Seriously, this is one of the most refreshing records of any point in this band's career, offering such bizarro choices as a vibraphone solo in Winter A Go Go, a squelchy, jaunty piano jazz number in the endearingly ridiculous but thoroughly propulsive Georgia vs. Yola Tingo, to an opener that's essentially three minutes of nothing but reverby haze. And it's perfect. Fight me! Summer Sun has no shortage of surprises, packaged thoughtfully and with care alongside some of the most perfect Yola Tingo songs you'll find anywhere. Today is the Day is a top 5 song, not just from this band, but maybe in all of dream pop. It's the kind of song bands like Beach House have been trying to write their entire career, and it stands with Mazzy Star's Fade Into You and Julie Cruz's Falling as a pinnacle of its style. I have heard this song over 100 times, 
and I don't think there's a day in my life I'll ever not want to play it. It's a song so good that anyone who vaguely appreciates the band and hasn't heard it simply can't know what they're missing. The swirling vortex of Little Eyes is almost its equal, a surging and trippy journey through a reverbed haze that is as blissful as it is awe-inspiring. Season of the Shark is a well-loved, organ-led gleam of sunshine on an otherwise wintry and blustery record. Tiny Birds is the requisite James track, destined to be underrated alongside his other greats. Moon Rock Mambo synthesizes the jazzy, funky piano of the record's weirder moments into a hazy, dimly lit dream pop stunner with some properly propulsive fills from Georgia. And this is all before we get to the 10 minute jam of Let's Be Still. Now, Yola Tingo are obviously no stranger to 10 minute jams. But none sound as fulsome, colourful and eclectic as this one, bringing together all forms of brass, woodwind, percussive and electronic instrumentation into a maelstrom of joyful noise, riffing and improvising and colliding and harmonising and at times completely writhing in dissonance. Whatever feels good, whatever feels alive. And this song, maybe more than any other by this band, feels alive, like it is living and breathing as you hear it. The record closes with an understated cover of Big Star's Take Care that can be almost easy to overlook were it not for the fact that this is one of their best covers ever. You'll need to stop sleeping on Summer Sun, and if you're already a big fan of this one, keep spreading the good word. Number 4. I am not afraid of you and I will beat your ass. By a matter of three seconds, this is the longest Yola Tingo album, and boy oh boy do they make the most of it. The title promises a proper assault that is thoroughly delivered on the raging guitar noise of opener past the hatchet, I think I'm good kind, which in its particular stormy rage recalls the Verve's underrated 1995 album A Northern Soul, and is probably low-key my favourite opener from this band. The title of this album though is a mission statement that is hilariously all but abandoned immediately after the opener. Don't get it twisted, if you're expecting something loud and ferocious, you'll absolutely get that from the opener and the closer, which collectively add up to 22 minutes of the album's runtime but you'll hardly get it elsewhere. As can be expected from this band, the album title is a tongue-in-cheek tease that, like the record itself, grabs you by the scruff of the neck before issuing you with a whirlwind journey through a myriad of genres, styles, approaches, and executions, while never at any point feeling anything less than a pure shot of Yola Tingo through and through. Like Summer Sun, not every single one of the 15 ideas here gets perfectly executed, but even more so than that record, the moments that misfire feel as acutely of a piece with the moments that succeed terrifically, and at no point do you ever feel that the band lacks complete command of their studio and their ambitions, lofty as they may be. There's jaunty, show tune-esque lounge music and beanbag cheer. There's irreverent falsetto-led 50s jazz pop in the irresistibly charming Mr. Tough. There's squelchy, afrobeat-influenced electro-funk in the heavily distorted fusion jam The Room Got Heavy. There's intensely overblown shoegaze noise laden with carnival-esque organs in I Should Have Known Better. There's a fucking Elvis Presley-esque blues rock rager in the squalling and combative Watch Out For Me Ronnie. There's what might be the closest you ever get to a Yola Tingo Bond theme in the playful, ridiculous longing of point and shoot. There's gorgeous stillness in the uncomplicated longing of James's black flowers, and especially George's I Feel Like Going Home, another all-time classic track and favourite of mine that feels like it could fit in on an early album from The National. And I haven't even mentioned some of my favourite deep cuts, like the harmonious thrust of the race is on again, the 9 minute piano drone centerpiece Daphnia, which resembles a lot of Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross's soundtrack work that would come long after this album, and the stately but utterly 
fucking magnificent song from Mahila, a song I could happily listen to on a loop while I drift off to sleep any and every night. I Am Not Afraid Of You and I Will Beat Your Ass is an album so loaded with ideas and stylistic diversions that it's practically bursting at the seams and at the capacity of a compact disc. And if you're not fully in on the band, it might drive you nuts. But if you can hit their wavelength, it's a consistent and unwavering delight. And even the moments where they can't quite hit the mark are tracks you dare not skip for the sheer confidence of the attempt. It's a great example of the best kind of double album. The throw it all at the wall masterpiece that any band worth their salt will inevitably give you after long enough. And if you're smart, you'll take it as a joyful indulgent of talented musicians giving you their all. Maybe the title's pretty fitting in the end. Number 3. Electro Pura If Painful was the first album that nailed the synthesis of squalling guitar noise and dreamy nocturnal atmospherics, then 1995's Electro Pura took that approach and doubled down in every respect. There's little here that's straightforwardly pretty and less that's sheer maniacal noise making but everything collides the two together in a haze of deep dark blues and late night restlessness. Several of not only Yola Tengo's finest songs, but also some of the greatest indie rock of its ilk can be found here, not least in the classic Hollywood tribute Tom Courtney, which is maybe the definitive Yola Tengo track? Their gold sounds, if you will? A moment where their messy style approaches transcendence and then leaps into the light for three perfect minutes. Opener Decora gives Georgia a chance to reach similar heights, its wordless chorus the peak of her evocative style as she's complemented by a hooky guitar screech. Pablo and Andrea and the Ballad of Red Buckets are sheer bliss with fuzzed out edges and some absolute instant classic melodies. The solo in the former is simply one of the best solos ever laid to tape. The redolent organ tones of The Hour Grows Late are some of the best ever recorded by this band. Don't Say a Word is so dominated by intermingling ghostly vocals that it threatens to evaporate entirely. And personal favourite of mine, My Heart's Reflection, is a hauntingly still ode from Ira to Georgia that feels like a waking dream where the physical space between the players on the track contributes as much musically as their actual performances. And I've seen many fans of the band cite the 9 minute closer Blue Line Swinger as their finest track. An update on the bliss of Painful's guitar solo finale I Heard You Looking, to incorporate a dominant lead organ part, a maelstrom of additional noise, and perfectly positioned vocals from Georgia that add as much as her multi-tracked, disorienting kit work. It's altogether a messy, explosive, cathartic finale, befitting a record that consistently ties all those attributes together. It feels like the furthest exploration of the possibilities of the electric guitar in indie rock since Dinosaur Jr's early work, and one that clearly inspired the subsequent work of indie bands with jam tendencies like Built to Spill, whose 1997 album Perfect From Now On on, takes clear reference from this album. In a golden run of classic records, Electro Pura gets weirdly overlooked, perhaps because it's the most unkempt, ragged and unclean from a production standpoint, but it leans fully into its uncompromising style with such graceless intensity that its power is undeniable, and it stands as a testament to the endless possibilities of formless, slackerfied indie rock in its prime, an era where the sky was the limit and a basement could be lit up like a moonless midnight through the sparks of exploding amps. Number 2. And Then Nothing Turned Itself Inside Out With the exception of the adrenaline rush shoegaze bliss of cheery chapstick, 2000's And Then Nothing Turned Itself Inside Out is almost entirely a cold, desolate trip through humming, eerie suburban dreamscapes. A record where it's perpetually 4am, where the environment you experience it in can contribute as much as the actual music to the effect, which is one of post-apocalyptic desolation within the wee hours. 
where the swampland and hidden corners of New Jersey suburbia remain alive with the hum and hiss of electricity. It's an album that sounds simultaneously lonely and comforting, an album that begs to be experienced in the smallest hours, under a neon street lamp haze, laying on your back on a patch of grass and staring up at light polluted skies. It's the sound of living in a city that sleeps with one eye open, and it's one of the best records ever made. Eerie opener, every day, disarmingly pulls you into a soundscape of paranoia with its humming organ tones and loping bass line. Saturday sparks and glints through a synthetic haze layered with wind chimes and studio noise. The crying of Lot G dances in a single spot, a waltz reverberating outward. Tears are in your eyes, and Let's Save Tony Orlando's House are star turns for Georgia, the former one of her most moving and devotional ballads, and the latter a showcase for how her gentle voice can provide the perfect counterpoint to the busiest percussion, as she serves as her own harmony and counterpoint. Deep Cut Highlight Madeline might be a better turn for Georgia still, a tale of female friendship and love that stands as one of the band's sweetest songs, covered in a layer of thick fuzzed out bass and organ tones from James and Ira that give it an edge of special sauce. The requisite cover song George McRae's You Can Have It All is a mid-album standout and one of their best, gently goofy but also wholly endearing, especially when a sticky cello part enters to round out the arrangement in its blissful finale. Album standouts, Last Days of Disco and Our Way to Fall are two of the most beautiful songs this band have ever recorded, in distinctly different ways. The former is the peak of the record's more desolate and haunting moments, a fractured childhood tale of dancing but feeling alone, surrendering to instructional pop music and embracing the adolescent feeling that you're destined to live on your own in the shadows. The latter, by contrast, is the single most tender love song in a discography stacked with them, where even George's cymbal brushes sound like a hug, and the omnipresent organ tones have never been more gorgeous or more sad. It feels like a hand gently closing around your heart as Ira describes in mundane but specific touching detail the experience of falling in love with Georgia as she very softly and subtly adds backing harmonies at key moments. Closer, Night Falls on Hoboken is the logical endpoint of the record's unfussy minimalism a near 18 minute excursion through jammy explorations of tone, noise and harmony, anchored by an addictive loping bass line from James. It's a song that feels like sinking into the earth on a late summer's night, absorbed by the soil, falling in slow motion, detaching from your body, free and untethered from everything. It's a fitting finale for a record where the buzz and drones of feedback and reverb feel as important and focused as all of the traditional elements. Finally, we get to the number one Yola Tingo album. I can hear the heart beating as one. The title of greatest indie rock album of all time is a difficult one for me to wield. Not just because it's a meaningless and limiting task to assign such a label, but also because indie rock itself, throughout the 90s and especially beyond, has come to encapsulate so many different styles of music and so many different levels of accessibility. It has gone beyond the obvious small label origins and come to represent everything from bedroom recorded noise jam albums to expensive, slickly produced, radio friendly alt pop with a layer of two of fuzzed out shoegaze guitar. Indie rock is no longer a status symbol as much as it is an umbrella term for a whole host of vague signifiers, of music that takes from disparate traditions and weaves them together in disparate ways. An indie rock song can take many forms, can sound like it comes from any decade, can have an intimate sense of its own cultural place, or can be an unfixed, unfettered expression of an emotion and nothing more. I Can Hear the Heart Beating as One is as close as you can come to a definitive indie rock text. It is an album that sounds like everything else, and as a result resembles nothing else. 
It is a 16-song voyage through peerless and flawless executions of every sonic style and vestige of rock music from across the four decades preceding it, filtered through the distinct eclectic tastes of the three people sitting at its centre. Turning an old Beach Boys classic into a noise-laden shoegaze rager is perhaps the boldest example, but the band offer no shortage of their own timeless contributions to the canon at nearly every turn. The first eight songs, roughly half of this record's runtime, is the longest consistent run of perfect music on any indie record. The closest any other record has come to approximating the significance, eclectic variety and flawless execution of this is Broken Social Scenes, You Forgot It and People. Journey through those first eight songs alone and you'll come to understand basically any and every way that rock music can make you feel. The adrenaline rush of Sugar Cube is timelessly invigorating. The Velvet Underground influenced bass line and percussive thrum of Moby Octopad is a crash course in 60s sensibilities through the lens of 90s aesthetics. Damage is the definitive indie breakup song, so minimal it threatens to barely exist but with enough impact in its carefully deployed murmured lyrics ever-present drone and the solemn picked guitar part to utterly destroy. The twin pair of Shadows and Stockholm Syndrome are respectively the best ever solo turns of Georgia and James. The former a lonesome but comforting embrace of introspection and self-protection by lingering in the margins of life, and the latter a longing love song that gains more power from James's voice than it would in the hands of anyone else, topped off with a note perfect guitar solo led by probably the best use of a squalling, distorted single note since I heard her call my name. Autumn Sweater has adorned mixtapes across the last 25 years since its release, a centerpiece track that is probably the most overt classic here, the greatest indie rock song that doesn't feature a guitar, and it rounds out the perfect first half with flair. The second half of the album, though less immediate and innovative, is no less impactful and features some of the record's more daring, unconventional approaches to structure, sound, and songwriting. Green Arrow is pure nocturnal ambience, a languorous slide guitar and the sound of crickets and little else for five minutes. Center of Gravity is a gentle little slice of bossa nova led by George's tender falsetto. The Lion How We Told It is as tuneful and gorgeous as the harmonics of this band have ever sounded. The slide guitar incorporation on 1pm again gives it a vague alt country feel and the track itself stands as one of the most underappreciated slices of perfect songwriting. The contentious Spec Bebop is a 10 minute guitar noise jam that lingers in higher, more squalling frequencies to generate an effect that is less transcendent than their previous and later attempts in the style and more just hypnotic, shades of sparkling neon and interlocking with George's propulsive timekeeping. Some will find it interminable, but if you allow the restless thrum to take you over, you may genuinely start seeing waves of feedback as beams of light before your very eyes. A synesthetic experience generated in the synapses of your brain by a particular experiment with tone and dissonance that doesn't resemble anything else I ever heard. For comfort, the album winds down with a more traditional, post-rock influenced guitar frenzy of the measured but intense We're an American Band, with yet again some of Ira's greatest soloing, eventually leading his bandmates into simply making as much noise as possible by his side. A harmony of dissonance and ecstatic, continuous feedback. In every nook and cranny of I Can Hear the Heart Beating as One, nuggets of perfection reveal themselves. It is a seminal text and a vital staple in the history of popular western music. It's an album that can at times feel like a friend, with the kind of shared stories, experiences and complexity that comes only with rich, long-tested and secure companionship. And as much as an album can be a comfort, a salve, a cathartic release and even a friend, I can hear the heart succeeds, and if I could only ever bring one record with me to a desert island, or simply to whatever comes next, it would be this one in a heartbeat.
And that wraps up our ranking, countdown, and breakdown of every single Yola Tengo album. I hope that whether you're a longtime Yola Tengo fan or new to the band, you found this video entertaining, informative, and enjoyable. Uh, I hope that if you are new to the band, you got some recommendations or some idea of what records you'd like to check out from this band. There's really very few poor starting points, but Painful and I Can Hear the Heart Beating as one are pretty reliable. Uh, if you're looking to get into the band and beyond there just explore the dense and beautiful catalog of this amazing band give more love to underrated records like i am not afraid of you and i'll beat your ass popular songs fade summer sun and my may i sing with me and all the rest as well stuff like that there give that record some more love show some more attention and reverence to this band that have done so much for indie rock and music in general and continue restlessly to innovate and push their sound in new directions whether or not you want to come along with them they're just going to keep doing their thing and i respect it so much listening to all of the yola tingo albums again and again over and over this week has reminded me why this band are so unique and so special and have captured something across such an extended period of time that no one else will ever be able to match they are the greatest band for me, the greatest indie band, the greatest rock band, the band I love the most, I think. And I want to hear what they mean to you as well. I want to see your rankings in the comments below if you have an album ranking, or even just rank the ones you've heard and let me know what your favourites are. Let me know if you disagree with any of my placements on this list, if you'd put any albums higher or lower than others. And in general, just hit me with your Yola Tingo thoughts in the comments below. Really appreciate you sticking around, your attention means a lot, and I'll be back again with another solo video soon enough, I'm sure. But until then, I've been Riley, this has been another Jams and Tea video. Rock over London, rock on Chicago, Mercedes Benz, the best or nothing.